Good morning and uh, welcome to St. James in the City Episcopal Church. I'm Kate Kress. I'm John Fuse. And we're here greeting you warmly, welcoming you to this morning's service. And it's a very, very special day because it's one of the two days in the whole church year when we get to use this gorgeous shade of rose, not pink, rose. And I really love our vestments for this day. Why do we wear rose, not pink today? So today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, Ventare mm -hmm. uh, Sunday, mm -hmm. and like in Advent, um, which is a season of preparation, we just take a little pause from the seriousness. It's not lost on us that all of the burlap and black vestments <laughs> so that Lent's we've been wearing a, Lent's a bit of a schlag. <laughs> aren't the most tearful things in the world. Yeah. So it's a Sunday to yeah. just remind us that we are in God's house, and mm -hmm. even in Lent, we're supposed to rejoice. And what, oh, then, and Latari means rejoice. Yes. 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 So uh, we rejoice that you're with us. We rejoice uh, in all the good things that are happening here at St. James in the City, including the beautiful organ recital tonight by Jonathan Ryan. So you can jump on that live stream as well. And have a wonderful day and a great time here at the service. See you soon.
Bless the Lord who forgives all of our sins. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you and forgive you for all of your sins. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son Jesus Christ came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the, the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or on his height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. 
Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Ephesians. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. As he walked along, Jesus saw a blind man. His disciples said to him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent us while it is day. Night is coming and no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jewish authorities did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until the day the, they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? 
His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know how his eyes were opened. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, for the authorities had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? They reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken through Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when they found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Can you hear me okay? I think you know that I teach fifth grade religion at St. James School. It's one of the joys of my life, especially because the students every week say something insightful and penetrating about theology. And this week was no exception. We were talking about all the faith traditions of the world and how some of them are 2,000 and 3,000 plus years old. And one of the students said, well, how can we know that the scripture from these traditions is accurate after all this time being passed down for so many years? And it's a great question and it's a great challenge. It's, and the student gave the example, he said, it's like a game of telephone. And it is a challenge and, and 
so many of the stories that we hear in scripture from all the traditions, including Christianity, began as, as oral traditions, and it was a long time before anybody wrote things down on papyrus, in the case of Christianity, in the language of the time, Koine Greek. And so there was even more room for error as each person wrote things down. The Greek, as they recorded it, ran all the words together with no spaces in between, between and with absolutely no punctuation. So we can't exactly know for sure when one idea stops and another begins. So scholars have just done their best to reconstruct the punctuation and the meaning as best they can. In other words, they play telephone. And why am I reminding us of this this morning? Because it very deeply affects our understanding this morning of the first few lines in the gospel passage. If we change the punctuation very slightly, add one period and switch another period to a comma, our gospel takes on a meaning that is the meaning that I believe Jesus would have originally intended, and it saves us from a very big misunderstanding of God's purposes. So humor me for just a moment and open your bulletin, if you will, and turn to the gospel passage that you just heard Father John read. First, I'm going to reread those opening lines as written, and then I'm gonna read it with a change, and I'll show you the huge difference that it makes. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Notice how it says, he was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. This would mean that God caused his suffering on purpose. And I do not believe that God ever causes our suffering or wants us to suffer. I believe our suffering, in fact, breaks God's heart, that God loves us so much that God grieves when we suffer. So feeling the way that I do, God loves us too much ever to zap people with suffering to make a point. That is not a God that I would want to follow. Jesus does say here, clear as a bell, we do not suffer because we sinned or because our parents sinned. We know that's true. That can't be true. Um, because all of us sin all the time. If God wanted to zap us for sinning, God would have a full-time job of <laughs> just doing that. So if none of that is true, it's not true that God causes suffering for our sins. It's not true that God causes suffering to reveal something to the world. Then what does this passage mean? I think we need to know because we see so much suffering in the world and we want to understand why it's happen happening, why suffering that is so sometimes unbearably cruel and unfair happens. We need answers. We need to know why that blind man was suffering on the steps of the temple. We need to understand this multi-generational game of telephone. So back to punctuation. And I was an English teacher a long time ago. Remember, the original Greek didn't have any punctuation. So how do we know for sure where the periods and the commas go. We don't. So look at the sentence, he was born blind. And now stop and put a period there. He was born blind, a fact. Then the next sentence would begin with the word so. So that God's works might be revealed in him, change it to a comma, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. See the difference? The man blind from birth wasn't born blind for a reason. He wasn't born blind so that God could do anything. He was born blind 
It grieves God that he grew up never being able to see the world him, world around him, but God didn't cause his blindness with any ulterior motives in mind. However, if we look at the new sentence that follows, we find big meaning waiting there so that, God, so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. We must work the works to make something out of the suffering that this man experiences. Jesus came into the world as light. Before he came to shine that light, it was as if we were all born blind. We could not truly see. And by shining as he did, Jesus taught people to see the world around them in a new way. He says so later in today's reading. He says, I am into the world. I came into the world so that those who do not see may see. Jesus came into this world to shine light on how we can do God's work in the world. Work the works of God. I love that expression, work the works. I wish we could all wear buttons that say, we work the works. <laughs> it's an incredible and perfect call to service. Suffering exists. We know it exists. Terrible things happen. A man is born blind. A woman is diagnosed with cancer. A child goes to sleep hungry, wakes up hungry, spends the day hungry, wondering when next she will eat. God does not cause that suffering. They did not do anything to deserve that suffering. But Jesus says, when we encounter suffering, and we will encounter suffering, move in, get to work, work the works of God. What are the works of God? Well, the works of God are the things that God would want us to do, the things God is all about, love, compassion, mercy. It means that the man born blind should not have had to have spent his life sitting on the steps of the temple begging for food. Working the works of God means that that man should have been embraced by community, loved, protected, cared for. This means overcoming our own spiritual blindness to see and respond to suffering everywhere around us. That means bringing food to people that we know are hungry. It means sending resources to people suffering far away, like our brothers and sisters in war zones and facing the aftermath of natural disasters. What all of this means is that if we want to see God in the world, if we want to see God take on suffering, then we need to see suffering and work the works of God in response. Respond. Take action. Jesus is so clear about this when, when he talks about light. He shines a light on what we need to do, who we need to be. It's almost as if he's shining a bright, blinding flashlight, kind of like these television lights that we have ever since the live streaming, in our eyes to wake us up and compel us to see. This world can be better. There can be an awful lot less suffering if we ourselves work the works of God. Instead of saying in the face of suffering, where is God? <laughs> Instead, we know that we are here. Our purpose is to be God's workers, to work God's works. We are here to respond to suffering. Christ shined a bright light to show us both the suffering and the way that we can serve. Amen.
us affirm the articles of our faith by reciting the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation, he came down from the heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He's ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. If anybody is celebrating an anniversary or is in need of a special blessing, you're invited to come forward and to receive one, or birthday even. Good point. Let us pray to the Lord our God. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop John, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Ismael Sanchez. I ask your prayers for those in need, especially Armando, Carter, Diana, Garrett, Jack, Janet, Jim, Joseph, Kendra, Lindsay, Maggie, Sean, and Sohila. was off. Now it's on.
Good morning, everyone, and peace to all of you uh, worshiping right alongside us at home this morning. I know I'm not Bishop Frank Brookhart. I heralded his return in this week's newsletter, but he's under the weather today, so we'll have to celebrate the return of Frank and Sue Brookhart as parishioners here at St. James after a sojourn at St. John's Cathedral, and we'll be so happy when they're back and happy to hear him preach. You may be unaccustomed to seeing us wear this fetching shade of pink called rose, and it's one of my, only two days of the year we get to wear these amazing rose-colored vestments. This is uh, Laetare Sunday, which means rejoice, and it's a moment in the church year, in the season of Lent, when we step away from our, our solemn and serious introspection and anticipate the joy of Easter. And so that's why we have rose color on this Sunday. And one thing we have to rejoice about is that tonight at 6 p.m., uh, we have an organ recital by Jonathan Ryan. He will be here 6 p.m. in person. You can also watch on the live stream. And apologies to those of you who are watching today at home. You may be watching this service delayed because we've had some glitches this morning, but we, we're thinking of you and, uh, and feeling connected to you anyway. And now, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to thank you and praise you, holy and gracious God, creator of all things, ruler of heaven and earth, sustainer of life, for you are the source of all goodness, rich in mercy and abounding in love. You are faithful to your people in every generation, and your word endures forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with the fellowship of saints and the company of heaven, we glorify your holy name, evermore praising you and singing. We praise you, merciful Father, not as we ought, but as we are able, because in your tender love you gave the world your only Son, in order that the world might be saved through him. He made you known by taking the form of a servant, healing the sick, liberating the oppressed, reaching out to the lost. Betrayed, reviled, and nailed to the cross, he confronted the power of sin and disarmed it forever. In his offering of himself, he became the perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Redeemed by Christ, we have been adopted as your children. By your pardon, you have made us worthy to praise you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it. Do this for the remembrance of me. In obedience to him and with grateful hearts, we approach your holy table, remembering our Savior's sacrifice and rejoicing in his victory. Confident in his sovereign purpose, we declare our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we be renewed in his risen life, filled with love and strengthened in our will to serve others. And make of our lives, we pray, a pure and holy sacrifice acceptable to you, knitting us together as one in your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say in our many languages, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. Amen. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who stand before you, and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.